1903, the Wright brothers changed the world with their motorized flight of an airplane. This old Fairchild dates back to the early days of aviation, and in its heyday, it saw a lot of blue sky. Air travel has come a long way in a century. In fact, it has mushroomed into a major industry, where at SeaTac Airport alone, 76,000 air travelers arrive or depart every day on giant airplanes. About a year before the Wright brothers made their famous flight, our Washington Conference of Seventh-day Adventists was officially organized. A number of young churches in western Washington would comprise the newly formed conference. And just as this old airplane was built with a purpose to fly, our conference of young churches was organized for the purpose of saving souls and preparing lives for Christ's return. As with flying, our conference has come a long way. And yet, we still have that original focus of those turn-of-the-century pioneers. Where I'm standing today doesn't look much like a sacred place. But when it comes to early Adventist history, this corner of Third University is holy ground. In 1886, Charles Boyd was president of the North Pacific Conference, which included all of Washington and Oregon. That summer, he pitched a tent right here and held evangelistic meetings. The first night, a huge crowd turned out to hear Elder Boyd speak on Daniel 2. The Seattle Post Intelligencer reported that many stood on the outside because the crowd was so large. Ten new Seventh-day Adventists were baptized in Lake Union and a church was organized in downtown Seattle. Just as airplanes are built to fly, those Washington Adventist pioneers knew that churches and conferences are built to save souls for God's kingdom. And since then, many Washington Adventists have looked longingly at this skyline wondering what can be done to reach the people who live and work here. And just like the visionary, Elder Charles Boyd, a new team has joined our Washington Conference with similar vision and passion to reach downtown Seattle. I look out over the city from the Space Mill down to Safeco Field, and I just can't help think, wow, this is our parish. I'm Greg Nelson, and this is Shasta Burr, and we're with the Anchor Point Church. That's a brand new church plant in the heart of downtown Seattle. This is Pike's Place Market. We love it here because it's it's symbolic of the amazing diversity that exists in, in downtown Seattle. Right now, we're a church without walls, so this is our church. And Shasta and I are trying to meet as many people as we can uh, to build those relationships. We do that in the elevator, we do that in our buildings, we do that out on the streets, we're doing it at the coffee shops we attend, the crepe places, anywhere and everywhere. And there is so much ministry that happens because we are living right here in the heart of this city. We can't imagine trying to to reach the people in this community without living right in the middle of them. Uh, we're trying to start a church in this downtown oh. area. <laughs> What's your name? Harold McKim. Harold? Yeah. Greg Nelson. Nelson. All right. Nice All right. Meet you. <laughs> Harold, what's the last name? Metcalf. Metcalf, we're watching for him, man. People will ask, why are you here? Because we got asked that when we moved out here. So keep talking about that. <laughs> Why are you here? What's the response? Yeah. I mean, just make sure you know it. I don't know what your response is, but we decided to be honest. We decided to, to it's an opportunity to cast the vision. It's an opportunity to, to lay a foundation. They may not ask you more for more information, but it's a, down the road, but it's a great way for us. We, I started responding just by saying, oh, we moved here. We're going to be starting a brand new church. We're trying to create a place for young professionals in downtown Seattle who live or work here, a place for people where they've given up on church perhaps, but still wanting to search for God, you know? And so it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity for me when I get asked that question to say a lot of the things that I know they're struggling with, or I think they might be or something that might draw them in and so it's a great opportunity for me to open up and just to share my picture of God and to share the excitement of what's going on here no strings attached they I mean they asked me why I moved here and that's a great way for me to just say that's mm -hmm. why I'm here and that's mm -hmm. what I believe in and you've said that you're a pastor oh yeah and, and has that ever turned people off surprisingly no I was really nervous I, I, I hesitated for a while on how to say that but um, I've discovered that people that people have appreciated that and it opens up spiritual conversations of course and with the too. people that I found in the, in this apartment I've been very upfront too with them about what I do and what we're here to do they're asking me all the time so how's this new church thing coming Greg 
Uh, what's happening next? What are you doing next? It's as though they're very interested in this whole yeah. process. If, I, if we'd have chosen not to be open about it yeah. and just kind of hide this thing, yeah. we wouldn't have the kind of connection that we yeah. have with people. Or I was afraid people would think that if they found that out, they would think the only reason I was inviting them over had to do with that. And, you know, I just said, you know, we're, we're called here. We're being in Seattle. We're just trying to get to know the people, get to know the culture, trying to identify needs in the area. And what we've learned is, is this principle called the three B's, people in this city culture seem to follow this progression of the three B's. They start with belonging and they move to behaving and then they move to believing. So if we want to effectively reach people in the city context, we have to go in order of the three B's. Belonging, behaving, and then believing takes place. Which is opposite of what we've often tried to do in the past. In the yeah, generation. often we will go into a city, hold an evangelistic series, and hope that people will come. But what we're finding, that's the believing side. But people in this culture start come to believing yeah. after they've had meaningful relationships. So we always start with belonging. And that's what we're finding here. All the friendships that we're building is the con are the contexts for which we were able to engage people with the gospel. I joked when we first moved here for the first six months, it just felt like we were partying, or, you know, <laughs> feeding people and just doing all these fun yeah. things and giving cards and flowers. And I said, I'm just getting paid to party, basically, but it's paid off. I mean, yeah. we have relationships yeah. now that where now they invite us out to go hang out with them and their friends, and you find yourself not having to entertain quite as much because now there's so much other stuff going on, and they start inviting you to all their stuff. It's, it's been really fun. I just I know it doesn't feel comfortable. Um, always, and it's, it takes effort, and it's scary inviting people over, but I really encourage you to try it. I, yep. I, I just can't tell you what a difference it makes when people are in your home. We put together an Ingle scale, or there's an Ingle scale that's been developed, and some of you may have seen it. It's got baptism, the cross, it's zero, and then it goes all the way down to negative 10, is hostile to Christianity, and then you've got up to positive 10, which is people who are making disciples of others. And so you've got all these different slots along the way, and so, mon so many times we make all the emphasis, this one step right here from zero to one, and um, you know we forget to do the the discipleship afterwards oftentimes or we don't know how to reach the people who are he way down here and we just know you know a lot of our materials and stuff like that cover helping them make the, that decision people who are already ripe for Christianity and we have discovered in this setting that most of the relationships that we've built are with I don't know negative, yeah, negative seven, seven, eight, eight nine, nine. Yeah. I mean so so for us to start getting discouraged would be very easy when we don't feel like they're ever getting close to zero and we have had to sit there and and literally identify where we think these people are on that scale and look at what's the next step on that you know and say one step yes yeah, so somebody who's at a negative eight and moves to a negative seven or a negative six is worth celebrating <laughs> and if somebody who's moving closer to Christ I'm really working on a lot of things in my life and I am not perfect at all I mean I really I mean just because I'm getting baptized it doesn't mean that I'm perfect right now, right at this moment, I'm perfect. But it makes me feel so good to know that God loves me. To be a part of moving them from one step to the next. Mm -hmm. So we have to take courage in that. You know, we may not have 80 baptisms to boast, but we know that there's people that are moving closer to Christianity because of our relationship. And we've seen it dramatically happen in the context of the friendship yeah, and the relationship. Yeah. That's what gets the people who are the negative 10 to the negative 1 or 2s up one notch it's in the context of friendships with them that moves it gives it it opens them a little bit more to the possibility that god might be someone they yes. would consider having in their lives yes. last sabbath afternoon was bringing back my keyboards from our, our hotel where we had the service the concierges and the people in the leasing office and the base or the ground floor of our apartment complex they saw me carrying them in they all said oh how was that opening service how was your first service greg so i gave them a report my son had drove the U-Haul with me. We dumped everything out on the Friday. Saturday, I put him on the plane. I said goodbye to him and went back to the apartment. I was all alone. I was desperately lonely. So I got to my keyboard, which I often do when I'm lonely. And so I turned the speakers up. I'm sitting in my room playing this keyboard. This is a man who's used to a, a five-room house in the middle of the prairies out in Nebraska. That's right. Now he's in an apartment building with thousands right. of people surrounding it's a, him. I'm, I'm somebody that doesn't like to just hear music. I like to experience it. So, so here I am feeling and experiencing my music, and all of a sudden, on the wall of my bedroom, boom, 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 our neighbors. Aww. I said, I was sick. 
I said, oh man, I'm here to make friends with my neighbors, not to make enemies, and they're already upset with me. So anyway, to make a long story short, they I, I, I gave a few, they, they knew I existed. <laughs> Does God know I exist? That's David's question. Okay. It wasn't enough for me to know that they knew I existed. You wanted them to like I, I wanted them to like me. Man, I, I guarantee you, if you've moved into an apartment and you're wondering what to do, you bake some cinnamon rolls or have some fresh dessert and take them to your neighbors, you will be astounded at it. And they said, oh, we're so sorry. We couldn't come today. We had to work, but next week we'll be there. Mm. Well, that would never have happened had we not lived here for number one, and number two, had not just spent months fostering and nurturing a relationship through kindness and things like People that. People have been so excited to be a part of it. In fact, a lot of them have offered their advice and their mm -hmm. suggestions. We've mm -hmm. been able to ask a lot of them. So, so what do you think are some of the big needs down here if a church were to come in? What could they do differently? And we started, and that automatically starts pulling them in, um, giving them a little bit of ownership, gets them a little excited. Even they, they'll claim they don't believe in God. They'll claim they'll never come to church. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to see when they start giving you advice, it's perfect. Well, I like what you're saying. It's a journey, not an event. Our next door neighbor or lives across the hall, and we've built this relationship over some months now. When I told him what the sermon topic was and everything, he's, and this guy doesn't believe in God, so he says, he says, well, if you want someone to listen to this or, or whatever, he said, I'd be happy to do that. So here's a guy who doesn't believe in God who's saying, I will be like a kind of a, a, sounding, board. a sounding board for your sermon ideas. Unchurched people will get involved. In fact, we had some people come to our first service uh, November 3 who are not church. People will behave before they'll believe. So first they want to belong, then they're willing to experience or behave, and finally they'll get to believing. And that's kind of the order that we're finding yeah. is really working here in this city. God is really shaking things up in Seattle. But that's not the only place God is allowing things to be shaken up. I often watch the birds out my window here in the Olympia Church. I'm the secretary for the Olympia Church, and this is my office. On the morning of February 28, about 11 o'clock, I was up and ready to go. I had a luncheon appointment that day, and suddenly this loud noise, huge, very loud noise, <laughs> we had an earthquake. This earthquake really changed my ministry. Uh, I had been a youth pastor for all my career, 15 years, before I came to this church as a senior pastor, and two months after I got here, the uh, the church just really rocked around. And it, it was a, a horrible experience. When the roof jumped up and came down, and the walls buckled, and the concrete all cracked all the way through this whole facility. I just kind of watched things go, and things um, off the file cabinet slid around and it just continued to shake and the noise was bad. It actually kind of waved through the roof lines and popped a lot of the nails not only in the shingles but also in the uh, in the actual plywood that goes on top of the roof and a lot of that was popped loose and ripped up and so we started having a lot of leaks. The shingles started sliding down the roof and uh, the steeple got tweaked crooked. I was a member of the Olympia Church in 1976 when it was completed. We had orange carpet, which at the time was beautiful. That was the most bright, bold carpet I've ever seen. It was not something that you'd be invited and wanted to stay. It was something you, as soon as church is over, you want out. Outside, away from the red orange carpet. So everyone was glad when they noticed that the orange carpet had little bumps in it. A couple places you could trip over the concrete <laughs> under the carpet. Being the quality that it had been when the insurance company wanted to uh, reimburse or to cover the cost of the carpet, we are able to get a really good replacement carpet. One of the really difficult things that we that we came up against was the financial issues. There was a uh, deductible that was almost two hundred thousand dollars. We really needed the Sisterhood of Churches and the Washington Conference. What a blessing that was. The, we went up to the executive committee and told them that, hey we had an earthquake down here and we just have no way of handling this ourselves. They've backed us up and they have agreed to, uh, through the Sisterhood of Churches, to give us the, the money and the support that we needed. When we get done, we're going to have a beautiful new church. I was quite surprised how quickly they worked on that because I was on the executive committee for about two years up there. And I know the conference is very careful about how they spend their money. And we spend lots of hours talking about how this money should be spent. But the Lord gave them the insight 
the spiritual insight to see that this was something that they needed to act on quickly. So we came up with the 50,000 and uh, they helped us with everything else. Everything is going to be upgraded. The lighting, the sound equipment, the acoustics, the, uh, the overall appearance of the church. Uh, more modernized after 25 years. It's ministry, just having construction workers in our church. Uh, I mean, we now have an opportunity to minister to these people day in and day out uh, because we see them every day, we talk with them, we joke with them, we say praise the Lord for this or praise the Lord for that or we come across a problem and it's like, okay, well, let's see what the Lord's got for us. You know? and, uh, and sometimes we'll pray about stuff with them. It's just God works in mysterious ways, man. I mean, it takes an earthquake to get everything done here that it did. Patrick, for example, one of our subcontractors is Cover Boys Painting. He, um, he's not a member of the church. I wouldn't mind being a member. This is a pretty, the people down here are really nice. I enjoy them. They're really good people. Even my employees enjoy it down here. So it's, it's, been, it's been a wonderful experience for me. The ceiling uh, was all asbestos. And so when the, when the earthquake put cracks in the ceiling, we had to, uh, in fixing those, you have to completely apparently take the whole ceiling down, which means you have to go through a whole abatement process and get all the asbestos out of the building. And that was one of the big surprises for us, very costly surprise. And all the light fixtures had to be cleaned up too, but the cost of taking the light fixtures out and putting them back in was more than the cost of new lights. So we were able to put in new lights that are, are brighter and more efficient. So the Lord has been at work in this in a wonderful way and has given this church an incredible facelift. In the end, it turned out beautiful and uh, their congregation is growing like crazy. The church what went from a population of about 70 prior to the earthquake to 170 now, and they've been dislodged from the church. The Lord's working here. I just want to say, uh, to all you churches out there and the worship conference leaders that hey, it's, it's been great. And praise the Lord, this is the way it should be. In 1904, Washington Conference Adventists did something significant for Christian education. They founded Forest Home Academy. I wish I could show you Forest Home Academy, but it's gone. And that's because in 1919, it was moved to Auburn and became the present day Auburn Adventist Academy, where young people continue to receive a quality Christian education by dedicated teachers and staff. Somewhere near here, and not far from the Mount Vernon Seventh-day Adventist Church, Forest Home Academy once stood as a powerful witness to the truth that not only churches, but church schools are built to save souls for God's kingdom. Come with me to Orcas Island. This is a church built for kids. It's really fun skateboarding and kickflips and stuff. And if there were skateboards in Jesus' time, he probably would have rode one. The Bible says the little children shall lead them. That's the beauty of what's happening on Orcas Island. I had fallen out of the church. My wife had tried to get me to... Uh, come back and, and uh, meet some people here on Orcas Island. There was a, the mother church was in Friday Harbor and uh, they wanted to start, they had, were commuting every week to Friday Harbor and they wanted to start a little church here. Three years ago, a handful of Adventists and former members planted a church by building a school first. At the time, I, I wasn't involved, and my wife told me about this wonderful group of people that wanted to uh, not have to commute every Sabbath, and in the process, possibly, have a school that we could teach our kids Christian morals, Christian values. And when I walked in the church service, I was stunned by how the whole church service was uh, for the children. I mean, the, the majority of the congregation was children, and the whole service was wrapped around them, and it was beautiful, absolutely delightful. Uh, God called me at that point, and I felt compelled to be involved here at uh, the Orcas Church and the Orcas Christian School. And what a first-class mission school this has become. The uh, Orcas Christian School is uh, currently 7,500 square feet with four classrooms. Uh, this is 10,000 square feet uh, with four classrooms plus a cafeteria also. We're just really thankful and privileged to be out here on Orcas Island 
doing the build out of the campus of of the Orcas uh, Christian School. It's all top quality construction, really nice, well laid out campus. Campus layout, the ball field, the buildings we're building right now, that's the classroom. Uh, the floor plan of the classrooms is dividable so that the, the big ends make two rooms. This one here has an operable wall so it can come up and act as a meeting place. The gymnasium project is uh, really something special to us out here. It's a, it's a final build out of the campus. Um, the architects, Lewis Architects, have went to a lot of work to give it a rural feel and make it all fit in. This is the gym. It, it looks like a giant milking barn, but it's built like a state-of-the-art gymnasium. This whole thing is truly like a, a campus. It's, it's just a beautiful project from property corner to property corner. Um, there's an observatory. On a clear night, it's used almost every night. You know, you drive by and you'll see, you see someone in here using it. This is a 16-inch reflector telescope. It was donated by the University of North Carolina. And um, it's used by the students and the staff and really the community here on Orcas Island. When it came time to build the Orcas Church, there's no question, God heard their prayers. You can't build in a wetland in this area. It's, it's hard. Um, and we had applied for the school and got a permit and then the church, and they said, no, you can't do the church there because it's a wetland. So they, we were going to have to rotate everything clockwise so the school would be where that little sports field was when we drove in and the church would be, you know, here. And then we had to start all over for our school permit. And uh, I read an article in USA Today, which I uh, don't read that frequently, about that uh, local communities weren't going to regulate wetlands under 5,000 square feet. So we got the wetland guy back out to tell us, you know, how big it was, and it's 4,800 square feet. <laughs> So all of a sudden it wasn't a wetland, but what's interesting is uh, we moved in here in uh, October in the church, and in January that law was rescinded. So it's a wetland again now. And on this, uh, there's a lady on the island that appeals every non-residential permit for the last 22 and a half months. And uh, that was one of our prayer items. And um, uh, June 14th was the last day for them to comment. We called that night. Nope, didn't receive anything. And uh, she actually appealed, but it was two weeks too late. So they still had to have a hearing, but they kicked it out. So it's the first non-residential permit in 22 and a half months not to be appealed. And usually that adds 12 to 15 months, you know, to the project. Prayer has played a central role in the design and success of our very own overseas mission school. Now what we have is a Christian-based school feeding the church. This Field of Dreams approach to Christian education is working. People on the islands are sending their children and are being touched by our message. Now I think my children are the one, when they start going here, they were the one who really enlightened me to, to know more about the words of God because I was so jealous. I was like, this kid knows the Bible. Like Mackie here, what? one time I was doing her like a, like a banner and she wanted to, to, to include her favorite verse, which is? John 3.16. John 3.16, and that is? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him may not perish but may have everlasting life. That is for me is so amazing. I mean, I can't not even do that. And, you know, so I think all the, the, my children led us, my husband and I, to, to God personally. You know, I, I just can't thank enough the school because it's not just that they taught, they're teaching my children, they're also teaching the family. This mission school has just been approved to become the Washington Conference third senior academy. Isn't it exciting to see what God is doing here in the islands? New school, new church, but back on the mainland, God is doing something very extraordinary. Dedicated members are establishing many new churches and companies. Turning back the pages of our conference history, we find the ethnic minority work began in 1918 with the organization of the Lake Washington Church. However, the work did not really take root 
until the organization of the Spruce Street Church in 1945, which met right here for more than 30 years, beginning in 1953, and is now known as the Emerald City Community Church. From this early beginning of our ethnic work, many new congregations have been planted. Welcome to Love of Life Fellowship in Federal Way, a great little company. We are beginning our service this morning with Daniel Bennett, one of our local elders who is a barber in Tacoma. This barber shop is on one of the busiest corners in Tacoma. This is Youngblood's barber shop, right on the east side. And there's plenty of people in the neighborhood that come to this barber shop. God says that the hairs on our head are numbered. And that means each and every hair. So for me being a barber, the wonderful thing about that, since he numbers them, I thank God that he's able to replace each one each and every week so my clients will keep coming back. This is where I share the word of God with those that come in on a day-to-day -day basis. And you never know what the message is going to be because it pops up on the spur of a moment. Huh? I'm not the only Seventh-day Adventist barber. Chad Kinlow is also a Seventh-day Adventist barber. I'm 27 years old. I just try to live as Christ did. And um, in every opportunity I get, I try to, you know, minister. Finishing up on my man's fade here. Got to get him looking right as he heads up to some of the local colleges this week. You know, there's one thing funny about being in a barber's chair. I don't know why, but it seems like people just open up their heart to barbers. I guess they figure if, if they can trust you with your hair, no matter how much or how little they have, I guess they figure that they can trust you with their life's problems. So I found this to be, at sometimes even a better place of ministry than the pulpit. A lot of times you can't get to the pastor or the evangelist or the teacher. But right here, whoever sits in our chair, they have our undivided attention. And I really believe that God is using this place. The church that we start up with the pastor's name is Pastor Hobby. We just started up around a year ago. And the church is growing, I think, far beyond most of the members' dreams. They start off with probably around, I think, a good 20 strong. There's no army, uh, no Marines, no Navy in God's army, man. Uh, just foot, foot soldiers, foot soldiers. So you have to always study to show yourself approved, a workman. Uh, we constantly have our Bibles around here to, to let people know that this is what it's all about. It's about God. That's all we talk about. That's all we preach. That's all we know. See, we got a little man here. His name is Joseph. Say hi, Joseph. Hi. I know God led me here because um, I was in a little turmoil and, and it just led me here and, and it just surprised me how these brothers are so spiritually and I couldn't be in a better, couldn't be in a better environment here at Young Bloods Barbershop. Daniel and Chad uh, don't work on Saturdays uh, anymore. Uh, and being that Saturday is usually one of the busiest days in the barber and beauty industry, uh, it was really a sacrifice uh, for them to make that uh, adjustment. However, uh, I can see that God has really blessed them. Well, two months ago, we had our first anniversary. We have a regular attendance now of probably around 120, 130 people. I really thank God and enjoy this experience that I have working as a barber. Love of Life, organized as a church in February 2002, is taking off as are many of our ethnic churches. Besides the Everett Indonesian Church, there's the Bellevue Hispanic, Bellingham Hispanic, Eastside Korean, Federal Way Hispanic, Open Bible Fellowship, Renton Hispanic, Seattle Latin, Seattle Russian, and Tacoma Hispanic. In addition, there is Windworks, Anchor Point, South Sound, and Orcas Island. I'm not a pilot. 
my wife has said I never should be. But they tell me, if you want to become a good co-pilot for Jesus, take some serious time of instruction. We call it leadership development. And one of our most effective means to do this is the Western Washington Youth Challenge. Come on, kids. Let's go. A program like Youth Challenge makes certain people that can go out and change the world. Dear Father, I just pray that you'll bless us as we preach your words in the street, help their ears to be open, and open their hearts as well. In your name I pray. Amen. I think the biggest joys of being a leader is watching the people under you develop. I wasn't really excited to go into Youth Challenge, but I don't know, I just decided to go into Youth Challenge because my parents and my brother, they all wanted me to go. And as a leader in Youth Challenge, watching my kids, the people in my group, change, that was the biggest joy for me. I've always grown up a Seventh-day Adventist, but I wasn't a committed Seventh-day Adventist, and I wasn't committed to God. I was a wobbly, fake Christian who didn't have any firm beliefs. But after Youth Challenge, my beliefs were a million times stronger. It was like they were set in concrete. And every summer I think, God, I don't know if I want to do this again. <laughs> or, God, there's nothing more I can learn from this. But every year, I learn something, and I get a richer experience. What do you have there? Jonah and the whale. Jonah and the whale? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh either, but God worked it out. Yes, just like he does for the Megabook kids. It's absolutely inspiring to see young people embrace the Seventh-day Adventist message. Are you coming to family camp this summer? Yes, I am, and I'm bringing in my friend who doesn't know about Jesus. Only in eternity where we discover fully how many young lives have been touched by our ministry at Sunset Lake Youth Challenge. Oh, the lands of the free and the home of the brave. I could talk about sage ministries or women's ministries or men's ministries, and the list could go on. And I want to give you greetings from the Remerton Seventh-day Adventist Church. Recently, Bremerton local elder Keith Waldy, accompanied by his family and some friends, went to East Africa to conduct a series of evangelistic meetings. They couldn't come in person, so they sent us instead. Harry Jenkins and Elbert James, local elders from the Emerald City Church, along with others, presented meetings in India. In addition, local church leaders Bob Paulson, Dallas Campbell, and others have been very intentional in sharing the good news overseas in India and other places. And right here at home, in nearly every church across the Washington Conference, members just like yourself have become effective first-time evangelists. Equipped with the New Beginnings DVD evangelistic sermons and graphics, anyone can make a professional gospel presentation of our beliefs. We've been the first to embrace and use this Bible study tool conference-wide in our churches and in the coziness of our own living rooms. And it's creating solid new Adventists. Putting this report together for you has really encouraged me. And yet this doesn't begin to tell the story of all the good things happening here in our conference. But as I see what God is doing here in our conference, I believe that he is up to something very special. Our pioneers would be proud of what we've accomplished these past four years. Yet they'd be eager to remind us that just as airplanes were built to fly, this church was organized to save souls. And if we're faithful to the mission, this church is really going to take off. Good, I'm out of breath. <laughs>